Yeah, I mean, the, the freshest thing that I can tell is I've been to Naim in Mexico. I came back uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, I followed a lot of uh, presentation, papers, uh, demonstration, posters. And it was my first experience there. So now that it's fresh, I can tell that it was, um, it was an, a huge event and it was 12 hours traveling from uh, Paris, uh, where I'm based now. And um, yeah, I mean, the people and the projects uh, was really great to go there, both from seeing what, what other people are doing at the moment, but also presenting uh, our work, uh, which is uh, um, trying to develop an instrument that uses electricity of the body to make music. So muscular activity and brain waves. there and there was a lot uh, a very good feedback from people and there were also other realms other people trying to also research in that field so it was great to share uh, our uh, findings and uh, you know tip and tricks uh, what was the problem how did they solve it and what they made it so that was the the most interesting thing that happened lately and it was also a month a very uh, hectic month because it was uh, uh, there was isaiah the International Symposium of Electronic Arts happening in Paris. Also another uh, huge uh, conference with a lot of uh, mixed reality and uh, music, technology, these kind of things. So, but now, now luckily it's going through the summer and, uh, you know, all the feedback that you received throughout the year, they, they can finally be processed for, uh, for, uh, for September and, uh, and on. Yeah, nice. So it was the first NIME that you've gone to, but I, I guess you've been sort of, you've probably read a bunch of the stuff and seen I, I did i did i did read a lot of papers but never had a chance to 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 be at one and uh, next year is going to happen in uh, utrecht in the netherlands so that's definitely closer than uh, than mexico <laughs> yeah I've, I've followed the nine stuff quite closely and not super closely but like you know quite close i mean a bunch of the stuff like just being in the diy community a lot of that stuff just kind of like bubbles up a lot of the bella things and, and stuff like that i was having a chat with um Andrew McPherson, uh, maybe six months like, earlier this year, um, at some point we were, we were having a chat about, I did a presentation at uh, uh, whatever, Queen's, uh, same, uh, what's? Queen Mary? Yes, Queen Mary, yeah. Although I think he's somewhere else now, but at the time he was there. So I did a, a presentation for them. Yeah, we were chatting for a little bit before it. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of curious your thoughts on this, but like the Nime stuff, like I really love like, sort of speculative interfaces and a lot of like pushing at the edges of what it is. But often there's like, um, I mean, I guess that, that could be the nature of research, but often there isn't like a, a very substantial musical result. You know, it's sort of like, a, it's sort of, yeah, it's a speculative interface. It's like, okay, this is an idea and I can, you can kind of do this. But like, I, I don't often hear very compelling musical results from those, some of these and that's not, not necessarily a critique but it's it's a different area of focus it's not like uh definitely. yeah yeah definitely yeah, yeah. what to, what i can tell about it is that indeed you know you always expect uh, from uh, from a conference like this to have all these new things that also sound good to be honest one of the most interesting thing this year was instead speaking about old things and how do we care about older technology older software and uh, all the way of making music in a sense that we always aim to make something new and compelling every year, every time. And uh, this need and urge to make something new sometimes doesn't really, you know, the outcome is not really making new music or, or better music. And also thinking about the fact that there was COVID, so there was no uh, challenges to play with people. There was this kind of nostalgic way of, uh, of thinking about um, uh, new interfaces. There was a, a very interesting presentation about uh, one uh, uh, artist who, uh, during the lockdown, started to say, I need to invest my energy into something. Uh, for example, I should start to watch a series. And uh, she started to watch uh, uh, Star Trek. And from Star Trek, uh, she analyzed all the instruments that has been invented for that um, uh, series. And at the end of it, there is uh, one instrument uh, that uh, in the movie, it says, um, and it's going to play your own emotions. And of course, it was completely um, 
made up, you know, even the sounds on the Star Trek were completely made up. It was, that instrument was not real, but she did a whole investigation and even she texted and mailed the um, inventor of the scenography of Star Trek and she rebuilt that instrument trying to associate colors, uh, emotions and things. And it was really, really interesting to, to see. Wow. Yeah, that's I, I will. Uh, I will send a link later. Maybe I don't remember exactly the name, but I have it somewhere. Yeah, that's kind of cool. I mean, it's interesting that because with stuff like Nime or, or like digital instruments, I guess at large, even though they're, it's quite new and cutting edge, it, it has decades. It's it's like a not mature, but it's a sort of a fairly established practice, which lends sort of to nostalgia now. Like like we can look back and look at these early digital instruments or early, in this case, like imagined imagined instruments and stuff like that. You know, like we'll be busting out like retro versions of like the the hand controllers or whatever. Definitely. You know, it's like, yeah. A, yeah, that's kind of cool. Um, so, like, what did what did you present there? What was the the nature of the instrument? So I I came there with a colleague of mine. I presented a demo of uh, the board, the hardware that we have been uh, prototyping in Paris in collaboration with uh, Martin Klang from Rebel Technology. And uh, I presented the hardware and uh, also uh, we are developing a software uh, side in Max MSP so that we can acquire signal from uh, EMG and EEG, do some uh, processing um, and then uh, map these uh, uh, features to sound. And uh, my colleague was presenting uh, uh, another side of the project, which is coding uh, using the Faust language and uh, some of the toolkit and, uh, and the modules that we have developed there um, made in Faust, because our goal would be uh, to uh, develop a board that is uh, embedded so we can embed code in it, and potentially we can uh, get rid of the computer and do everything uh, everything there. And indeed, it was really great to see what at Bellas uh, they're doing and uh, you know the benchmarking of all these great uh, devices that are out there. It was uh, very refreshing to see. and. Um, so this this was uh, this was what I presented, and uh, I showed a, bo- a bit of uh, sonification, so how to sonify muscles uh, in a very raw way, just to give uh, an idea of, uh, of what it would sound like, and then uh, how to process the raw signals and try to uh, transform them in controlled signals to control, for example, pitch or amplitude or uh, the playback speed of a sampler, a granulator. <laughs> One interesting side of uh, our project is that, of course, we are coming from the Mayo uh, armband uh, device, which was a great tool, uh, commercial, and um, you know easy to plug and play. Although you know it had to be hacked for uh, being used in the musical field, but it was a kind of uh, fixed uh, instrument. You could only wear it in your arm. What we are trying to do is to instead uh, develop uh, each. Uh, set of electrodes independently so you could potentially use it in many sides of your body and there there were people trying to use it for example in their shoulder or in their legs or even in their mouth when we're talking or um, doing expression with their face with their faces so that was a very interesting feedback and um, um, and uh, yeah I think you know uh, when you go to Naim and you get so many, you know, more naive, but also more compelling uh, feedback, it's always great to, to take note and go back and rethink maybe the hardware, rethink the software, because it's so important when you create something new that is not just working on your, on, uh, your own practice, on yourself, but see also how other users might going to use it or misuse it. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one of the things that, like, I, th- I think about a lot and, and particularly more recently with stuff I've been building, but like the sort of like, I guess the scale, like the scale or the domain of usability, like often, you know, things might, you know, like necessity is the mother invention or whatever. Like, like I, I would need this thing to do this thing and then, okay, that's kind of useful, but, oh, I can also use it for another part of my practice, you know? So it's sort of still localized to you and then like, oh, like such and such might want to use it. And it kind of, it can sort of scale out and, you know, like how you sort of certain considerations can afford certain usabilities by other, other people or other uh, use cases while at the same time, obviously like, nobody wants to build the thing like that does everything because then it's kind of obviously you won't do anything at the end yeah (laughs) so it's like a kind of like uh whatever the opposite of like an uncanny valley where it's kind of like it's useful and then it kind of then at the end it just completely drops off um yeah so in terms of like the you want to have it i guess embedded in the long term so at the moment is it just um 
a kind of like an IO ADC sort of board that you then piggyback on a Bella or a, a, a Pi or a Teensy? Or is it like, is it already, does it have like, are you cooking the numbers on the board? Like, well, what is the nature of the, like the hardware that you've made or, like, that are working well, on? The, the hardware is based on the OWL, uh, um, on the OWL, uh, um, how would you say, um, system. It's, uh, it's uh, developed by Martin Klang and uh, it allows to embed codes like uh, Pure Data or uh, Gen Tilda and, um, and the Faust code, for example. So we are doing some pre-processing already in using Faust codes, but the sound uh, uh, part, so for example, there is no, uh, at, at this time with the first iteration, the first prototype, there is no um, available uh, output in the, in the sound uh, domain. And um, so we are trying to prioritize our, uh, our tasks, which is, for example, now we are working with the BioWare of, uh, of Martin Klang is the, is the uh, reiteration number three, the revision three of the OWL system. And uh, our plan is to create a kind of a daisy chain, uh, um, a second board that can be uh, embedded for um, combined with the OWL three and then be used as a, a biosignal uh, sensing device. So by combining the, the brain with this uh, sensing uh, machine, then we can create kind of sandwich board that will allow hopefully in a, in, a, in a future, like six months, maybe one year from now, to both acquire signal and, um, and uh, play, play back also the, the type of code you, you write on the board itself. And an interesting thing is that with the Leech module, which has this OWL3, uh, is also possible to uh, have it directly um, uh, controlling your modular sy sy uh, system. So it could be, you know, it, it, we are trying to make a hybrid uh, system that can be used as, either as a MIDI uh, controller, like with MIDI out or CV, uh, MIDI pitch band out, so we can uh, get uh, high resolution, but also as an audio, uh, audio interface. So we could acquire signal from the muscles as in a, uh, you know, trying to consider it as an audio uh, rather than as uh, as uh, as other uh, other things, and uh, we, we are trying to to research some features or some uh, um, let's say some um, aspects of how the muscles work in terms of uh, physiological constraint. And for example, one interesting thing is how to how can we analyze the sense of fatigue of a musician. And that is something that we started to see some uh, interesting uh, possibilities by analyzing the spectrum and the frequency of the signal that over time, as you get more uh, tired, uh, the, the frequency kind of shifts and uh, it changes uh, spectrum and potentially with some tools. And uh, at, at this time, we are trying to uh, uh, use and uh, experiment with um, unsupervised machine learning algorithm to understand how this fatigue sense can be used in, in a musical perspective. So yes, this to wrap, but uh, we are still at the first prototype and um, we, we, are, we don't really have yet uh, many boards, uh, but with the second iteration, which should arrive around October or December, then we plan to have more uh, boards like 50 or 100. And uh, being also an open science and open source project, we are aiming to get um, feedback from other users or people who are interested in working with this uh, type of technology. Hmm. I mean, that's like when, when you get to there, I'm, I'm definitely interested. Like I have, I have two um, Mayos that I, or Mios, I actually don't know how they're pronounced. I only really ever see it written. Mayo really shines. But I have two of them that I bought used a bunch of years ago. Specifically, at the time I was doing a project with a, a a friend of a friend that Patrick St. Dennis, who does a bunch of stuff with when he would have two of them on and he has, I think a bunch of stuff in super collider and controlling robotics. And he had like a pretty interesting and sophisticated kind of thing that he was doing. For myself, like with a lot of my performance practice, the, I have a big issue of I'm often holding sticks or holding something else. So either I'm, I'm playing guitar, piano, or drum, mainly drums, but um, I don't usually have uh, fingers free to press buttons, you know, even in a very simplistic way or to turn knobs. So a bunch of the testing I did with uh, the Mio early on was to just kind of do that. Like, and I had fairly good results so I could be holding a stick and if I kind of squeeze the stick, 
like I just did a, an aggregate of all the, I don't remember how many bands the Mio had. Uh, it's been a while. Like a sum of the channels to get a kind of threshold that when you yeah, squeeze yeah. it high. Yeah, yeah. I would just sum them and then just do a threshold. And that, that seemed to work pretty well. And it was kind of interesting in that I could sort of, I could play as I normally would, but then just sort of by, by t tensing my muscle, which is kind of relatively um, transparent or rather open. Like as if you see me doing that, you don't really, it doesn't jump out. So I, while I'm playing, I could kind of control things that way. And it seemed um, quite promising. I think at the time this was like between the, like maybe the, um, the switch over to Intel and the drivers or like there was some reason where it was just like, uh, this is, a little bit of pain in the butt and I kind of like stopped and I, you know, I have them in the box. I've pulled them out every now and again, but like, um, it was, it seemed very promising. And then for whatever reason, I just kind of moved elsewhere, but it's, it's a kind of a, an idea that particularly as, as someone who plays drums, like I, I can use my feet obviously, but it'd be really great to be able to like have an invisible gesture that I can do to actuate something. And then obviously Definitely. like you can extract, um, gestural data from that on top of that but definitely yeah i mean being a product that is not um, sold anymore and uh, it's already proprietary of facebook this technology <laughs> yes. yeah. so you know as a musician you also want to be able to have an instrument that can follow you and of course it can be become obsolete or something but now we are you know everyone who are reducing the mayo they're orphan of an instrument that doesn't exist and is not supported anymore and now moving to an m1 chip um with the silicon it's not uh, it's not compatible anymore and uh, of course there is no more research nobody's going to um, yeah. uh, update uh, you know whatever uh, sdk uh, and so on so definitely but if you if you're interested and uh, you know we have a very early um, simple device that you know it allows to acquire data from muscles we are not yet able to uh, although we did some analysis and it's promising, we are not yet able to use this board for EMG processing. But with the second iteration, uh, we are trying to develop a board that allows to uh, hybridize. I don't know how you say the, the term in English, but to combine the EMG and EEG together so that the final outcome, final uh, uh, output uh, can be, um, can be because our intention is to try to understand you know, a muscular activity is a very uh, clear intention, right? As you say, you have a, a stick, you can squeeze your arm and you can get uh, a, a, an outcome that you're predicting and that you're actually creating with brain waves. This is not really the case because, you know, it's a very complex signal and sometimes you think of something, but the reaction can arrive a bit later. We have seen that it can even be earlier than where you're thinking and, um, and another interesting aspect is that um, working with the neuroscientists, we are trying to figure out more interesting things from the musical perspective. And we were uh, starting to discuss about this concept of lateralization, which is uh, something that happens in our brain when we are thinking to do a, a physical movement, for example, but we are not actually doing it. So if you think of playing the drum, but being still, uh, the same areas of your brain, they activate as if you were actually still playing it. And this aspect, of course, is complex, but it's very interesting if it can be um, harnessed. And by combining uh, both the physical uh, movement and the brain uh, kind of um, um, cognition or, 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 or state of mind, I think it will be interesting to, to get some um, interesting musical results, not, not in terms of sound, but in terms of uh, control, perhaps, or, you know, the word control has always been used uh, in, in, uh, in many ways not in the sense of, you know, control of, I want to have these and uh, I'm going to do this, but there should be always some kind of unexpected uh, outcome together with it. Yeah. I mean, even, even practically speaking, there's, cause, cause I mean, I, something that I've think about every once in a while is that like, particularly with something like drums, it's a very physically, like there's a limbs and you're moving the limbs like off into their full extension. Um, if I want to hit something on a downbeat, my brain has to make that decision considerably before and begin moving like consecutive layers of muscle groups to make that happen in time so in my my own conception is like now but my brain is like do, 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 now when where you, is if you can tap into that like you know with this kind of reading you can conceivably have well you you would have very practically negative latency so let's say i'm doing a, some kind of computational process that i need to know exactly when an onset is detected or some kind of event um this would let you know ahead of time that this thing is going to happen in 100 milliseconds from now or whatever, which is, 
uh, that would be amazing. You know, if in code that you, you would know the future, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there's an old uh, bukla instrument. I, uh, I think it's something marimba, like electro marimba. I don't know what it is, but I think it's a um, marimba type thing. And then there were um, the beaters themselves had capacitive, whatever it is, but as uh, I, presumably from proximity and or velocity, as the signal changed, you would have negative latency. Like you would know that you were going to strike the thing before you struck it, which is kind of cool. I think at the, at the time it was an analog technology thing but like yeah I, I, that's a would be amazing to be able to know that in a in a digital instrument you know um and then obviously there's all sorts of implications for like you know physiology and music um uh, therapy and all sorts of other stuff as well like um but yeah i'm thinking specifically like performative like and, and coding wise what would be interesting to sort of know and do there in terms of um because I've, I've read on this stuff a little bit but like i'm not super up on the sort of the terms. Could you kind of explain the difference between like the EMG and the e e e c e e g? E e g e g. So e e m g. I will try. I mean, I'm not a neuroscientist, and I'm not uh, somebody who works in the physical uh, uh, health side. But from what I understood, I can tell what are the most interesting things that makes them different. Different. Well, E M G is electromyogram. So that's why myo is because it's the muscle in Greek. And the EEG is electroencephalogram, so from the uh, from the brain. And uh, the two, let's say, physical differences is that uh, um, uh, EMG data, muscle muscular activity, is uh, on a spectrum, uh, on a frequency spectrum that is audible, and that's why it can be sonified directly. It should be between five hundred and three thousand hertz. I don't remember exactly uh, what is uh, what is the range, but um, um, but it's audible while EEG goes from 4 Earths to up to 30, 50, depending on the, on the brain wave. We have five brain waves, and uh, uh, from lower to higher, uh, it's one we are more uh, relaxed and uh, in a deep concentration or in uh, REM, and these waves are very slow. They, they go very slowly, and when you are awake and uh, you have a lot of inputs, then these waves start to be more... Um, uh, uh, to, to move faster, but it's not uh, son sonifiable. So you always have to scale these ranges in an audible way. So it's not really meant for uh, for um, for uh, sonification. And uh, one interesting thing is that uh, EMG is more. It comes more from a physical effort. It's is is a, is a data that comes from your physical effort, while EEG is more probably. A, um, a kind of um, thinking effort, right? Or state, mental state effort. So you're, you can potentially be still, don't do anything, but consciously you have to do an effort to be concentrated, to be relaxed, to go into a meditative state. While with the muscles, the other way around, you can actually contract your muscles, you know, you can do all crazy things and in a way is two sides of the same coin and i find is that many things of uh, uh, emg uh, don't apply to brain for example responsiveness and uh, the complexity of uh, of a signal even in, in in the case for example we are trying to visualize this type of signal but being so low this frequency it's very hard for a certain software to go so deep into like five hours or uh, four hours of, of data, you really need to have a long buffer. While with uh, with EMG, you don't. So I mean, the, and then there are, there are of course you know other more physical physiological uh, uh, differences. I don't want to go too much into detail because I don't I don't know much exactly you know the the, the detail. I know that uh, you know EMG is a kind of stochastic train of impulses that have fires at the same time. So it's hard to maintain a kind of constant tension and have this uh, energy being always you know at the level. If you simply um, um, convert the signal into control control change, so the, in the our the interesting um, research that we are trying to do is to develop some kind of features or mapping modules that allows to somehow uh, maintain a certain level of control when you tense your muscle. For example, we're working on a kind of a joystick uh, module that once you reach a threshold that can be um, defined on the, on the GUI, it will start increasing the value 
as you go lower into a threshold, it will start decreasing. So you can somehow be on a higher uh, range and, uh, you know, by going up and down with your energy, you can somehow control a stable line and you could potentially control a pitch sound, which if you want to do it without any um, modulation of the, of, the, of the data, it will always oscillate and it's not really interesting to, to play with. Uh, and now with uh, with um, EEG, which is, uh, as I said, is very uh, complex signal, we are trying to get the, the band power for, for each of the waves. So we somehow filter out a specific range, usually the um, alpha wave, which is um, a level of concentration and uh, happens more in the occipital area of our brain. So we could close our eyes and uh, this wave uh, will start to oscillate. As you concentrate, it will start to rise. As you open your eyes and you see more inputs coming in, then this wave will decrease. And, uh, and uh, working with this type of data is interesting, but is not groundbreaking. There have been already a lot of uh, attempts by Alvin Lucier, for example, and, and, and so on. <laughs> So what we are trying now, and uh, you know, that's also one of the way that I met you and I saw what things you were doing, is because um, uh, of the Prukoma toolkit. That you know, being working as a musician from a musical perspective into this type of uh, multidimensional data is very interesting to use a tool like uh, Prukoma to experiment with things rather than having to code them uh, in Python or in any other languages, which would take a lot of time. And recently, I've been working on a module that uses PCA to um, decrease the dimensionality of uh, the, uh, the five brain wave into one, into one parameter. So, because they looks very chaotic when they play, and it's really hard to to get one wave to stay where you want it to be. And uh, and using this kind of unsupervised uh, mapping, uh, it, it seemed to give very interesting results, which we're going to try to experiment further. And uh, yeah, I think that more or less, these are the, the, the thing that I can say about the difference between EEG and EMG. And the last thing I think is that, you know, it's, it's all, it is all part of one system, which is our body and our brain. So, you know, the musical sensitivity, the, the experience in performance, and all these things, they come together. And uh, what, as a researcher and as somebody that's working in this kind of field, you always try to cut this dimension or these areas as if they are separate, right? Muscles, arm, brain activity, um, you know, your breath, your musical, you know, all these things, they seem to be disconnected, but it's actually one organic system. It's one ecosystem of things, which if you take separately, that doesn't mean anything. You know, you squeezing your hand is not your musicality, right? It's the whole thing together that makes it uh, beautiful and, and powerful.
Yeah, yeah. And, and and I think even in terms of mapping, and, and it's something that I, I think quite a bit about, is that the idea that often decoupling some of that, even conceptually. So let's let's say me a performer, like you know, squeeze my hand, or let's say I have a motion sensor, and I, you know, up is this, left and right is this. Um, these kind of gestures can often be like. I have a, a good amount of physical dexterity as applicable to musicality from playing a bunch of instruments. So there's like a stuff here. Um, but if I start doing like this kind of like theremin XY, you know, holding like a little motion sensor thing, I, I've done that for like dozens of hours. If I'm lucky, dozens of hours in my life. Whereas I've played drum for like hundreds, thousands of hours. Like the there's almost this like, okay, I'll take a, a, a an amazing performer. Here's this violinist. I'm going to strap a motion sensor to your wrist, a muscle sensor to your ankle. And now do these things like the it, it's it's like um, it's a different tool set, but also it, it almost like misses the I guess what you're getting at in like the, the holistic totality of what what like the musicianship comes out as like a, a violinist will, will have a lot of gestures that are naturally made and, and sort of quite complex and interactive and intertwined and everything. Um, but then, you know, if they're doing this with the, the bow they're you know, they're maybe not as good at that. So like having gestures that kind of call on this are from a design perspective can sometimes be wasteful of the information that's there, which is where I think like some of this like EMG stuff or, um, you know, like fancy, like mo like sensor fusion motion systems where like you can sort of, a performer can perform as they would and you can, as like a, a tool or instrument or system designer, find a way to extract information from that that um, can complement or augment or whatever, as opposed to like projecting the other way, if that kind of makes sense. Um, so in terms of like the, the sort of the system, so I guess for the brain stuff, you said you have five channels. What do you typically do for the EMG stuff? Like up, how, how many, up to how many inputs are you working with? Like, does the board allow, like how much is necessary? Like for often use cases, like what, what's the IO on this kind of stuff? Sure. Sure. Uh, just a parenthesis with the EEG, we, we extract five brain waves, which actually are seven because we take beta, low, middle, and high. But we are using eight electrodes, which are placed around uh, the skull, around the brain. And uh, um, since we know that the brain is, is, is um, uh, certain functionalities are more prominent in certain areas of your brain. For example, the occipital area is more for the um, for the concentration and um, and um, an image actually there is a lot of image projection so that's why if you open your eyes and close your eyes you can see this wave oscillating pretty quickly between zero and maximum zero maximum because the the this kind of feedback visual feedback is uh, is um, is what is the most uh, captured on this area and actually people are even trying to um, uh, okay, this is not a, a small parenthesis, but I will try to make it, uh, to make it because I mean, I think these are interesting uh, aspects is that you know, when, when you close your eyes, you limit your visual uh, uh, inputs. As you open them, you maximize it. So people are trying to close their eyes and imagine visual things like being uh, uh, sitting on a beach or, uh, you know, going running and, and etc. And you can see the wave. It's indeed increasing, even if your eyes are closed. While, for example, the lo uh, lobo, uh, the side areas of your brain are more, um, um, the functions are more related to audio and listening. So these kind of brain wave, uh, these electrodes can pick up this type of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, feedback that if you are listening to sound or music, then here is pretty much, um, it, there is a lot of things happening. While in the in the frontal cortex is more about uh, reasoning, calculating, mathematics, and so on. So this to say that there are eight electrodes, but could be many more to have a more clear understanding. And um, and that's the only you know parenthesis I want to to say. We have five waves, but the more electrodes you have, the better map of the brain you have, and the better you can uh, spot where is the, because these brain waves happen everywhere. There are certain areas that are more prominent and others that are less prominent. But EMG, instead, we are at this point, we have a, a, a possibility of uh, four inputs. So we can, uh, uh, we can measure the muscle group of uh, uh, up to four muscle groups. With the next iteration, we would like to reach six or even eight, potentially. And uh, at this point, what we are working on, which is very good, 
for uh, um, acquiring the signal, but not very good in terms of performance and uh, sustainability, is we are using uh, uh, gel electrodes, gel-based electrodes. So you have to stick them in, uh, in your skin, and once you're done, you, know, you can try to reuse them once or another time, but the more you use them, the less accurate and sensitive they become. And uh, we're using them because uh, the, the problem with impedance and technical things is, uh, is very low and we have a very good signal. While, for example, the Mayo has dry electrodes. So they have done a great software um, uh, calibration of this uh, data because there is a lot of common mode rejection. A lot of noise. It's being, a very, uh, um, being our uh, master activity very subtle, you have to amplify the signal. But amplifying the signal means also carrying with you all the noises that can come from uh, you know, the ground of the socket, uh, uh, common modes, rejection. Uh, if you move the cable, you get a lot of noise and all these kind of things. The Mayo has made a, a beautiful instrument that is, you know, it's, it's a closed system and the cables are all very uh, close to the electrodes. In our case, we have cables at this point and we have three uh, electrodes for each muscle group because we need to uh, have the ground, grounding your body. Then we have the signal and the reference. And we usually try to measure the different potential between two points. So having a, 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 with this board uh, at this point, uh, the ground can be shared for uh, each channel. So that makes one channel of three uh, electrodes and the other three with two. So at, at the end of it, you really have to see a lot of electrodes. And uh, you know they're not super expensive, but every time you have to use them, reuse them, it's not ideal. So the next step would be to have six to eight um, uh, electrodes, but we would like to use the dry ones. And, uh, and at the same time, with, uh, with a different firmware, we would like to have um, the same board that could be used for either EMG only, uh, with, with the right uh, uh, pre-processing and filtering in the board, or for EEG and then a final one that combines uh, the two. So you can potentially make uh, four EMG channels and four uh, EEG on the same uh, on the same board. Yeah, uh, it, it's funny, like I was just reminded of a bit ago of time and like these technologies that like are, well, in this case, sort of obsolete as a product, but um, reminding it as well of like the, the Wiimotes, you know, like when those were, you know, I mean, you can still kind of use one now, but it's, you know, they're sort of in sort of obsolete territory or like first generation iPhones and things like this, like the the idea of being like a technologist at like the edge of, um, I guess, speculative capitalism. You know, like I think things like the Mio, it, it's really amazing tech, but like I, I remember from like the adverts, you know, like you're going to be using like controlling your TV or whatever. Computers, mobile phones, practically any um, electronic device through hand gestures and motion. Nobody wants that. I mean, I guess now that they're, they're trying to do the same thing with the goggles or whatever, but it's like, uh, um, it's these like uh, solutions in search of a problem kind of thing. Whereas like the core technology and specifically the implementation and encapsulation is really quite sophisticated. And it's unfortunate that I presume it's closed source in terms of like the, the firmware and what they're doing like at like a system level that, um, yeah, it's just kind of interesting, like high tech stuff, but like at the edge of, it's not like a Mad Max situation, but it's sort of like a high tech, you know, like we're, we're sort of using like these scraps of like consumer level, very high tech um, things and, and uh, in musical context, just kind of reapplying these. I, I came across recently this concept of like perma computing, which I don't, I don't even come across. Mm -hmm. Perma computing. It, it's still kind of new to me. So like in, in sort of there's a, a concept of I presume they're taking the name from like permaculture, which is like uh, you know, a way that you can approach agriculture where you um, it's not in, not so invasive and not so like like you sort of survey. I, I don't remember the concept of permaculture, but like, you know, I have this land here and these type of things try to grow here. So I sort of put things in a, in a way that they kind of grow and manage and you sort of create a little bit of an ecosystem. Super simplistic reduction of it, which I'm sure is partially wrong anyways. Um, but I think some of the ideas are the same in that um, at the moment, like, I mean, the, the computer in my watch is probably fast enough to do a whole bunch of stuff that I would want to do musically. But it's like this disposable, you know, thing that's going to be, you know, the battery's going to die in a year. You know, like we're, we, we're surrounded by technology that um, is incredibly powerful and incredibly useful, but through uh, combinations of plasma obsolescence, including batteries, closed operating systems, always on connections, you know. 
a lot of it's gone to waste. So I guess the the sort of movement or the idea is to take these like old phones or you know old uh, ThinkPad generation thing and like still use it in a in a way that you can make music with it. But um, yeah, to try to leverage like all this like uh, existing computation that we're just surrounded with, um, which is kind of an interesting concept. It's uh, there was a thread on on a forum that I go to on the lines, <clears throat> lines forum talking about this, and one of the the things was like at what year would you consider like computation or computers being good enough to do what you want? And in this case, like having an embedded thing, like an owl is a pretty, I mean, I'm sure the, the newer owl will be faster, but it's, it's not a very fast system. Like it's, it's just system. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You cannot compete with uh, smartphones or, uh, or things like that. Definitely. But it's, it's fast enough to do a lot of this kind of stuff. And the same goes for, you know, even like a lot of machine learning oriented things like, or like a phone. I mean, this phone, if I could hook up to a system, it, it probably plenty fast to do whatever I wanted to do, but technology is not built that way, which is a whole separate conversation. But um, it's kind of interesting to think about like this sort of idea and how like now embedded options for music stuff is getting a lot more possible, but you know, still chip shortages and all sorts of other complications and things like that. And, um yeah even things like like the bella which is super powerful and super well super usable not very powerful it's it's like the bella uh, beagle bone black or whatever is like eight nine years old now or whatever it is it's like a definitely slower than a phone you know um but like with things like when you're getting to machine learning stuff where you need a little bit more umph um you kind of push at the edges of that but it's just an interesting kind of domain, like feeling like this. Yeah, like, I definitely, yeah, no, no, I definitely share your uh, your vision and your thoughts on it. I'm personally very interested in to this idea of embedding a system. And even at, at Nime, uh, there was a, a first uh, attempt to embed uh, uh, neural networks on the Bella. And still, you see that you need a host computer. It's not something you can run directly on the on the board, but you always need some kind of steps that. You, you need to have a more powerful system to, you know, analyze your data, create a model, and then, uh, you know, embed it uh, back again on the system. So we, I think that we are at the early stages, or let's say, kind of maybe even advanced at one point. And there will be a lot of energy, and I hope there will be a lot of energy and effort on that, because, you know, it's always this idea of having a dedicated machine to, that you have to bring with you all the time and you have to switch between uh, patches or, or system. It doesn't really make it feel like an instrument. You know, most of the time you're always tempted to open your laptop and change a little scaling factor and you always uh, get lost in the technology. And uh, this idea of embedment, uh, I, I find it very powerful. And um, although I understand that we don't yet have uh, a system that is capable of, of um, calculating or running uh, complex systems. I think that there are very promising attempts. Even, um, for example, uh, uh, you know, we can we can talk about many things. We can talk about. Uh, I, I really love, for example, the Daisy Seed by Electrosmith. This board is amazing, and uh, you know the new attempts of uh, Cycling Seventy Four with Rainbow to create a system that allows you to export you know, complex patches into a code that is usable on the web, uh, on, on the board, uh, um, as a VST and so on. And I see even that Jack Armitage, he managed to create um, a system that allows to, um, to embed Flucoma in the, in the Bella. And, um, and already with Bella, it's possible to, to get uh, rainbow patches to be uploaded into into the system itself. I mean, it's, it's still a very, uh, it's, it's a, how do you say, we always go away a little bit from the music perspective, but I think that now we're dealing a lot with technicalities and uh, and way to overcome, you know, limits or, or make things possible. But I think, you know, it always comes together. And uh, there is one point where, you know, this technicality perhaps are gonna be overcome. And then you can go back into playing with them, uh, stress them, and use them for uh, for uh, for what you m want to make them on the first place, which is to make music and make some kind of uh, gesture controller or or a device that allows you to play better or to play in, in a way that you never expected. And I think that's very powerful and very interesting.
un, un, well, un, not unrelated, but related to something that you mentioned kind of ages ago, which I'm kind of curious about because you were talking about like with muscle stuff, how it's kind of within the audible spectrum and, and you know, like the idea of sonification, uh, like it, maybe I'm just kind of curious how you approach sonification and or where sonification sort of turns into mapping. So honestly, honestly speaking, my approach is more into the um, control signal generation. So I try to process the raw uh, data of muscular activity and use it to control a sound parameter. I did some experimentation with uh, sonification by, you know, simply converting the numeric data that I receive as a MIDI pitch band, so with high resolution into audio using the SIG object, for example, and uh, passing them through a low pass filter, one pole low pass filter, and, uh, you know, just um, getting the, you know, analyzing a bit the spectrum and hearing the crackling noise of, uh, of uh, muscles. So, to be to be honest in this in this case uh, my my sonification plan was uh, you know was stopping there so i didn't really do many experimentation on that size on that side although working with atau atau tanaka you know he has a, a great uh, um, uh, experience behind by working with emg sonification and um, and uh, and things like that I think at this point, uh, our interest is, is more into the control processing side because uh, you can potentially control any gear. Could be your modular synth, uh, Apache, Max, uh, DAW, or um, you know, create your own uh, your own uh, sound algorithm. Why with sonification? I feel like it's sometimes very personal choice, right? To sonify this type of uh, this type of data. Um, in terms of EEG, you cannot. You you will have to re re rescale the ranges, so it doesn't work. Sonification, and um, yeah. So I, I even uh, I've been uh, following some um, uh, music act space uh, um, events and courses about sonification, and I found very interesting approaches. Me personally, um, I'm uh, I I don't really have a lot of knowledge of uh, how to. You know, because to me, sonification sometimes is just a translation from one word to another. And uh, I have never been able to retain the original characteristic of a signal, even if it's the weather or it's the stock market and numeric data and sonify them. I haven't been able to find a, an interesting way to make them sound good because it, it, it's a great way to get numbers and to generate data, but to make it musical. Uh, it's a little bit more complex, and I never had the, the the chance to really go deeper into it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, not that I've done very much with it myself either, but my experience has been kind of similar in that, like, because there's there's a kind of idea of like, okay, I'm gonna take a color and transpose that to a pitch, and just you know, like 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 where you just arbitrarily take one set of numbers and treat it as another set of numbers. I could see how that could be useful in like a data science thing, which I think they do. Like if you're analyzing things, you could listen to it and then you could find patterns that you wouldn't have otherwise. So there's like a kind of a usefulness in something like that and like sonic ecology or whatever. But I think for yeah musical purposes, it's, it's a, uh, yeah, I've not really heard very much that's kind of interesting. I think the, oh, a bunch of years ago, like uh, Marco Donnarumma. Yeah. Yeah. I had like kind of a very low fi like a microphone on the thing. And I, I think, all the audio was roughly sonified or using sonification as a jumping off point that he would then process. Yeah. And that kind of sounded cool. It had its own aesthetic and sound world. Um, but in that case, it's more using it as like a almost arbitrary source as opposed to like just pure sonification um, where you sort of, yeah, just hear the numbers. Um, but yeah, I think it's that it's the, the sort of not the secret sauce, but like the, 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 the devil is in the details of like the mapping and, and what, and how much smoothing and what what gets mapped to what and one to many many to one many to many and you know that's like a whole a whole world there of of that side of things
I was I was talking to Jack and, and some of the stuff that I've been trying to build is to basically embed some of these things I've been doing with SP tools in, in Abella. So like at the moment I have a couple patches that can kind of run over it. One of the things that, that, that did jump up in that and they're just like, because doing it that way, we're basically running or he's running Flucoma pure data as compiled for Bella. So it's basically running lib, uh, pd.lib or whatever you know, on the Bella, which even on its own, just doing that eats up a bunch of the CPU just on a Bella, just because you have to load the whole lib, um, the pd.lib. And then on top of that, putting the patches. So I think I, I still need to do some like um, more uh, real world testing as in like putting the code on it, hitting a drum and, and getting the latency, like hearing the sound. Um, but even just putting like a very uh, like very low level like onset detection with some descriptor analysis stuff was using up like seventy percent of the CPU or something and like not even doing anything heavy. So I have um, I, I basically I'm trying to build uh, many things. But one of the things was I have this landscape noon, which is like a passive drum sound making thing, which sounds really cool. <laughs> I want to embed something where, because it, it takes CV input and it takes eight CV, uh, eight gate CV inputs and then two more, so 10. And, um, you know, I have like one of those expert sleepers, like uh, audio to CV things, or there's a bunch of MIDI to CV things, but um, it's a little, it gobbles up a lot of IO. So like, I don't want to have to like plug audio into my sound card and then send eight channels or 10 channels of audio to this thing. Like, um, so the idea would be like to have just basically a, a completely enclosed system where there's like, an audio can go in or, or USB can go in and then it itself does all the onboard processing and then it does all the um, DAC to spit out 10 channels of CV. Um, so my, my plan is to use Abella specifically for that purpose. And it should be, it's not heavy patching and there's a, a little bit of machine learning stuff, but not very much, but just it, it's uh, because it's all running on top of uh, pd.lib. Yeah, it's like pushing at the edges of like what the Bella can kind of handle. Um, yeah, so I, I'm interested to see how that, that stuff's going to develop and yeah, like the rainbow stuff from cycling now, because for many, many, many years, I think the owl was one of the first of these, like, oh, export gen code yeah. and, and run it in there. Like they were sort of like I don't know, almost 10 years ago or whatever, like that they had hardware for that, which is super awesome. But for me, it was always like, even as someone who's quite computer literate, like I'm an okay coder, like to have exported C++ code that I then need to compile and put on another system is like, there's so much, like the difference between like, oh, here's a bunch of C++ and now put it on an owl. There's like a gap there that's pretty big. Um, and, yeah. and, <laughs> and the same was the same with like gen, gen code export and all that. Um, so I guess Rainbow sort of addresses that and that you can kind of, I mean, it's a limited language for now. I, I imagine mm -hmm. they're gonna expand it, but you can just kind of do regular max patching and just kind of put it on there. Exported there, yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll see. And, and then I guess being able to leverage like because it can run on a Pi, I think a Pi is faster than a Bella. Mm -hmm. That's where the, that's how the organelle is based on, right? This instrument, so. it's based on Raspberry Pi, if I, and there you can run PD patches. You know, I think one of the, you know, indeed it's, it's maybe it's early. Um, it's powerful because I mean, being both Max users, it's, it, we see how easy or some how how powerful it is to write patches and be able to export them although max is a, a, a proprietary uh, software so many things cannot be shared or let's say you know not many people can uh, can work on this so um you know hopefully there will be you know but anyways it's a great attempt to make this uh, kind of gap to to be filled somehow with this uh, with this technology and uh, the owl indeed is one of them in, in our case, we, we are working on a project that is completely open source and open science. So we cannot, at this stage, uh, be able to, to even try to use the Rainbow, uh, the Rainbow compiler. But, uh, you know, nonetheless, is, uh, is something that I, I'm sure it will take a lot of place uh, and, and uh, effort uh, later. One other uh, random interesting uh, um, uh, software or, or a way of uh, writing code and embed it to, uh, for example, the Daisy Seed is the software called Plug Data, Plug Data, P L U G D A T A, which is basically uh, an open source uh, uh, software. It's really great, uh, made by a bunch of uh, researchers who are doing a great job by uh, re uh, consolidating the max patching environment 
but using pure vanilla object, uh, PD vanilla objects. And uh, there is already export in C++, uh, DAISY, and uh, other uh, exports, and that's completely open source. And I find it also incredibly promising. And uh, we are now discussing with our team to either uh, be able to build some of these toolkits we are working on, um, on Faust, of course, uh, um, because also we have one of the main uh, researcher uh, around the, the Faust environment, Alain Bonardi, in Paris, uh, but also using uh, tools like, uh, like these to, to be able for an, uh, users also to, to perhaps look at the code and uh, change their things, but also for developers to be able to, to, to contribute. Because I think in this, in this field, this is, as, you know, every time there is an issue or, uh, or something you cannot overcome, you open, uh, for example, the free common discourse and you uh, write an issue or you go into a forum, uh, Discord and all this or that. It's great to be able to, to share, uh, you know, um, obstacles or, or uh, findings uh, there. Even if we are a kind of an early stage, you know, by building blocks and as the computational power of, uh, of uh, for, for example, the Bella or other system, they grow, the more possible it will be and more easier also for developer will be to develop their stuff and, uh, and just, you know, make their instruments. I find it great. No, it's, it's really exciting. I, I looked at plug data before, like all the coding I was doing for the stuff that I was putting on Abella. I was just doing in, in vanilla PD, which coming from like being a Max user was is really brutal. Like, I mean, even just mechanically, like the way you have to kind of code. And um, yeah, I, I want to look at plug data again, because one of the things that I found not frustrating, but that in order to go on a Bella, because it's lib, uh, pd.lib, it was it's vanilla only. So things like Cyclone and stuff that's like very common extensions that I think are just embedded into plug data. Um, mm -hmm. As a Max user, I I don't exactly know what all the vanilla PD objects are. So like I would type in like counter or something that exists as Cyclone but doesn't exist in PD, and I would just build a patch and then not realize that like oh shit it's not gonna mm -hmm. it's not gonna work. So I need to then go you know. So I I uh, I, I, I opened it up in a tab here. I'm gonna look at it again later today because it would be amazing to use plug data, but I don't know if you can disable like the extension so you only have vanilla. Um, so just to be able to use the UI and stuff like that, um, but then have it only be like pure vanilla PD thing so you can embed or whatever. I know that lately they made a major uh, update with uh, a bunch of objects and uh, capabilities. Uh, but yeah, indeed, I also should look into it. But for what I understood is that you are using the same name of the object in Max. So a counter, for example, but it's based on another object of pure data. For what I understood, Maybe I'm wrong and I'm swapping the two things around, but I can understand that at the beginning you, you have to, because being both Max and PD, you know, also as a developer, you have to choose which of the two words to follow. Like, do you want to give uh, the, 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 the easy workflow of Max, but maintain the name of the objects of PD, or you want to maintain the Max uh, objects and um, a name and but use the PD ones, but being based on the vanilla one, and I'm sure that for some boards you can go up to uh, PD uh, 049 or something like that, not PD 5.3 uh, or something like that. There, there must be some ways to enable or disable some functionality to make it cross compatible. Yeah, I need to look at it again. Like when, when I did, I, I basically re I created a bunch of the well, not a bunch, like maybe 10 or so. Um, abstractions from SP tools in PD, which was a whole fun experience in and of itself. Um, but most of the coding, because I mean, the code exists and the languages are kind of similar enough. It was mainly doing things like counters or or very basic things that just don't exist in one versus the other, or like list processing was very unpleasant in pure data. So like I had to find a lot of workarounds for stuff. Um, but yeah, like I, I first I started using, uh, it wasn't plug data, but it was another one of the like... Um, Poor data. P U R R data or something. Yeah, one of the yeah, per like with the two R's. I used that for a little bit and then like after a little bit, then I opened it up in vanilla and I was like, oh, actually shit, that's not a real well, that's not a vanilla object. And I was like, I didn't want to have to do that over and over. So I was just yeah, like yeah, yeah. I was just using uh vanilla. So I'll, I'll look at uh plug data again just to see that. Cause for like all my daily driving, I just I'm used to Mac, so I have no problem for myself using Max. It was mainly just doing the Bella stuff for uh, sorry, the pure data stuff specifically for Bella, 
just to be able to embed it. Um, hey, I would like to know maybe you know later or something about these SP tools that you have uh, released. It seems to be a lot of work. I really enjoyed the examples and the layout and everything. Maybe you can uh, say a little bit more of what was the um, the origin, let's say your motivation to make them. And uh, you know that's always great that you share all your knowledge and practice with others. It's it's uh, it's very inspiring. So if yeah. you want to, yeah, so... thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll 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 just kind of share screen here real quick um, and just kind of like talk through a little bit of it. So it, it, it was born out of like, I guess my my working with, the, the start of it was working in, with Flucom as like I was on the project initially as a composer um, and then just working closely with them for five years or six years or however long the project was actively funded. Um, I ended up building this kind of performance practice around the idea of um, extracting a bunch of rich information from individual onset. So like hitting the drum and then from that moment, like very accurately analyzing, you know, loudness, centroid and things like that at the beginning. And then as the Flucoma tools expanded, started doing things like classification and analyzing MFCCs and, and really um, optimizing that. Cause that, that's one of the main things. So like, I think even just like off the bat, like opening up, um, you know, any kind of like, I want to analyze like loudness or whatever. So like fluid dot buff loudness or whatever. Um, you know, it'll do the thing and it, it uh, you know, you load a file, analyzes the stuff and, and things work well, but over doing just loads and loads and loads and loads of testing and optimizing and, and tweaking and, and massaging everything, it, ending up with stuff where um, it's a lot of like uh, attributes and stuff that are just really fine tuned to get the most out of these tiny analysis windows. So that was the kind of the jumping off point and from that point, it's just sort of built out as in uh, some of it at the beginning was also like trying to recreate the functionality of like the stuff that you could do with sensory percussion, uh, which is this kind of, you know, closed machine learning, you know, drum software, hardware combination thing of which they've just released a version two, which now comes with like a audio interface as well. So it's like a, a whole ecology thing. So I wanted to do some of the stuff like classification or uh, I mean, that's one of the main things that, that I sort of pulled over from that. So these provided kind of good exercises as jumping off points. And then from there, yeah, it just really has kind of grown. At the the, the last update, um, which was the version, or the current update that's at the release at the time of this video or whatever is a version eight, which I think uh, went up to like something like 60 odd abstractions. Mm -hmm. At the moment, I'm, I'm not fully there, but like this version nine is, I mean, it's at 90 objects at the moment. So it's, it's really kind of grown to kind of, when I reach 1.0, I, I plan on changing the name for many reasons, but I think one of the reasons is to also make it a little bit more open so it's not just drum and percussion stuff. So anything where like low latency, fast responsive stuff is is important, it'll be useful that for like, you know, plucked instruments. It may not be great for tuba, but if you play violin, flutes, you know, vocals or whatever, it'll still be really good for that. Um, so yeah, it's just really been more than anything just <laughs> what often comes into my head is like the like squeezing water out of a stone or whatever like having this tiny finite window of of audio to work with and to try to get as much information from that as possible which is one of the interesting things like in going back to this idea of perma computing or like computation or like like a bella or a or daisy or whatever where the kind of stuff that like playing back samples super super like you could do that on like a, an arduino you know a, a five-year-old arduino can do that just fine but doing that very quickly is where things kind of get problematic and that's why where another things of like um which for me makes the bella very attractive because you can theoretically run with a very low input output vector size in practice with the kind of patches i'm running i couldn't go down to two samples or whatever it lets you go to um but yeah, they're trying to get all that happening very quickly. So like from the moment of hitting a drum, um, analyzing all the descriptors, running machine learning to get classification and playing back a sample within the time of, let's say 10 milliseconds, like the whole thing of that, um, which totally works. And uh, it's, yeah, it's just doing a lot of that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's been really interesting coming up with this and then also thinking about interface and um, to a certain extent mapping, but specifically like how things are exposed and how like a, a, a sort of ecosystem kind of plugs together, like how you 
put together musical ideas and structures in a way of like kind of what I mentioned in the beginning, like as me myself as a, as a performer to like, you know, people I know to now like software that's usable by, you know, other people to do other things. There's a certain kind of affordances that you kind of build in to make it for one thing still like this is, I mean, there's a, a max for live version of things, but um, it's for like tech fluent kind of things. It's, you know, it's, you can come in as a, as a beginner, but it's, it's largely for like, okay, I'm kind of, I know my way around max a little bit and I want to leverage some of this stuff um, just to make that kind of stuff very flexible and usable um, and powerful. More recently, I've been working on, um, I don't think I have this stuff on the webpage anywhere just yet, but uh, kind of like a DIY version of the hardware or rather coming up with uh, DIY hardware. So the idea being that it's um, something that you could 3D print. So I spent quite a while in like, you know, Fusion. Um, and, you know, once this is fully done, my, my plan is to sort of fully release this with the 1.0 version of SP Tools, like when it gets to like a sort of a mature thing. So uh, designing it in a way that like with a hobby 3D printer so, and off the shelf parts, relatively off the shelf parts, um, someone can just print out these things um, and just, yeah, have their own version of something that, um, is quieter than the sensory percussion hardware in terms of noise and signal to noise and frequency response and all that. The I'm using, there's this company called uh, Sci-Fi, but they have these, um, this modular guitar pickup idea. So there's, I don't know if you've ever looked at much of that world, but there's like old school uh, polyphonic MIDI guitar stuff. It would have like a, a separate uh, output per string. So you could do pitch tracking and do conversion to MIDI. Uh, but there's a, a kind of um, a world around this polyphonic guitar because guitar is often it's a monophonic signal that comes out. But if you have a separate signal per string, there's a lot of interesting processing that you can do. So um, basically they have these um, kind of single standalone um, pickups that um, yeah have a really flat frequency response. Um, they're sort of shielded, they're active, so they have a built-in preamp and all that, and they're compact. So basically building off those, I kind of made a PCB and then just built a whole kind of focus specifically on doing it with a, that you could do it with a home 3D printer. And mm -hmm. other than needing that pickup, and I think you sort of have to have a small PCB made just because the wiring is, it's not a lot of parts, but it's, it's a little hard wiring. I, I did one on just a breadboard, but <clears throat> I think for regular people, that's going to be too unpleasant. So just with one of these pickups and a PCB, I think there's a resistor, resistor and an LED, and the rest is like screws and battery bolts, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, it looks great. That I'm, I'm working with. Mm. And I mean, even towards that, there's a, hold on, do I have a photo of that here? I'm doing some, this is another thing that I want to kind of do off with the Bella, um, where I'm doing some testing where because these things are, DIYable and also cheaper to make. Um, I've done some testing where at the moment I'm, I'm still working things out, but having four of the sensors on a single drum, eventually it'll be, uh, I think I'll, I'll work out a different version of the hardware that can mount inside the drum so it doesn't take up as big a footprint okay. like on the surface. Direct in the surface. So there's an old um, paper, it's not that old, It's I forgot the, the main author, but it's also Andrew McPherson where they use optical um, sensors on a drum and then I think they have six sensors on the drum and then they use um, time difference of arrival to basically triangulate the position. So um, if I zoom in, so this is, I think, me hitting the drum um, closest to the sensor at the top. So the audio arrives at that one first and then this is presumably the left and right and then this is the one that's furthest from it, right. which kind of makes sense. So um, there's a whole bunch of uh, formula stuff that you can kind of run that into um, and then some kind of calculusy stuff, but basically you you draw hyperbolas that kind of overlap. And then basically the long story is you can tell exactly on the drum where you hit. If I hit the drum here, um, you know, it'll arrive to these at, at different times. So, so the, this is kind of at the moment it's solvable and, it, it, and I can do it in Python. A friend of mine wrote a, a Python script to kind of compute it. But as it turns out, solving um, four quadratic equations uh, in real time without iterating where did I put the, the window? Um, is computationally... Uh, yeah, uh, heavy. Yeah. 
as in and and most of like like in either python or and if you're doing external it usually just calls on a library they'll be like numpy or whatever or eigen or something they just tell it like literally there's a function that says solve and then it returns you a value um but to do this in real time and fast it there's uh because this is what's basically done in gps stuff uh so it's kind of a solved problem there's ways that this can be formulated in a closed form solution the maths of it gets beyond my understanding quite a bit but i'm chatting to a buddy of mine who's uh got a better math sense about him. So idea being that like you can take the audio from it and have it, you know, essentially instantly tell you, you hit here, you hit here, you hit here. And then with that information, you can do whatever you want. Um, but that's another one of the things that I'm kind of, I'm excited about what this sort of hardware will enable. And that, you know, um, at the moment, like if, if even if I'm using like, uh, I have a, the version one of the sensor percussion hardware, you know, if you want to have three of these, uh, there's a shop, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, that's also with the interface and with the software that I think they're going to start selling the individual sensors, but they're probably going to be a couple hundred dollars each. So if you need four of them, you're looking at like $800 at minimum or something that's impractical, you know, whereas like four of these, this is the biggest cost is a hundred dollars for four of these. And then plastic and a bat, you know, like the rest of it is small. Um, and then if you, ideally I want to do this again with a Bella where, um, the onset detection and this kind of stuff would hopefully happen again, cause I don't want to use a ton of IO on a sound card when I'm performing. So it'd be nice to just have something that looks like, uh, this, you know, with, with better things and all of these go to a little, like a Bella that's in like a little enclosure and then all the, all the number crunching happens on the Bella and then it spits out, um, ideally audio rate position uh, right. or you over USB over MIDI or whatever to, you know, max or whatever else I would want to do. And this looks amazing. And uh, I really like the fact that, you know, your perspective is being a percussionist, an experienced percussionist, you have, you know, this vision, but I see also what you said before about the, C uh, the CP tools that you're trying to make it going also out from the, the only realm of percussion. So I have a question about this uh, uh, this um, uh, instrument that you're trying to build. How, how is how is the, um, what is your thoughts about um, you know other musicians or uh, percussionists or violinists? Uh, how do you, how does thinking of other instruments or musicians, other way of playing, contribute to the design of your interface or of your tools? Do you first do it just for percussion? Then you say, okay, it's working. And now I'm going to try to amplify it to other areas. Or you have the vision already embedded while you do your, uh, the, your programming or, or designing of the, of the board. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, it was focused specifically on drums at the beginning and for a long time, just because I was building, even before like Flucoma, I was doing things like this for, for many years with that as a main input. And even just pragmatically speaking, there's a very, very big difference in terms of caring about pitch and not caring about pitch. And in drums, I often don't care about pitch. I, I actually do use pitch as a descriptor and it, it does give me some interesting usefulness and correlation, particularly in combination with like pitch confidence. So like if there's a low pitch confidence, it's likely a noisy signal. So like I do analyze pitch descriptors for drum stuff, but the tiny, tiny analysis window that I typically use doesn't give you for one as, as you know with the brain stuff like you have the 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 frequency range on the bottom end is non-existent um and on top of that the accuracy is also so so mm. so things are kind of tuned to this tiny window i it is built in with sp tools that you can specify bigger fft windows and, and analysis size and i think in the current help files or the next version of the help files i've kind of baked some stuff in like okay if you are using pitch stuff here are some settings you can use and here's the difference that you can see in resolution. So that's one of the main ones in that, like, for example, if I'm a flautist or a violinist and I'm doing pizzicati or whatever, um, actually violin pizzicati would probably be fine with the current windows, but let's say I'm playing guitar and I'm playing on the lower strings, the pitch, it's, the pitch track is just not going to be good because it's not, I mean, with, with all of these kind of things, you trade latency for accuracy or pitch range like there's some sort of trade-off there as a fundamental thing like the longer you wait the typically either the the wider the frequency range you get or the more accurate response you get which is one of the things that i've i've optimized and i it's 
there's a little bit of overlapping stuff that you're kind of looking at in that one of the things that I, I've built and it works in a specific context where fundamentally I, I'm analyzing, uh, at, let's say we're doing 44.1K, I'm a analyzing 256 samples. Um, and that's like five milliseconds, almost six milliseconds. I found that to be like usable. It's tiny. It's like, it's, it's almost inaudible. Um, but it, it lets me do classification. It lets me do loudness. It lets me do like the, all the descriptions I'm working with. It, it works well with that. It's at the edge of that. Like any shorter, I think would not It'll work. Yeah. Um, but like with that, there's no way you have any sort of sense of morphology. It doesn't exist. Time, there is no time. That's a moment. Um, so I've done this stuff where I analyze, let's say I, I do a bunch of hits on the drum and I train it, like I create a, like a small data set of stuff. I get this 256 sample version and then I get a uh, 4,400, like 100 millisecond version and I just stick it on a, a neural network and I basically just as a regressor so I train it up where when you see the descriptors for this short window, predict what the descriptors are going to be for a longer window, which with a, a, a finite set of sounds. So for example, if I have my drum here and I have certain objects and preparations and the drum, tum, tum, the drum is tuned in a certain way and I'm playing with sticks, I'm not making infinite sounds with this. There's a finite sound world that I'm working with. So I could just play a bunch of examples and I can train in a regressor and it kind of works. So that's something that I do to sort of time travel fake morphology it, it doesn't work with unknown well maybe with like heavy 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 big machine learning stuff maybe it could be generalized but it does require a kind of like a pre you know not supervised but like like give it a sound sources that like when i see these numbers give me these numbers um and that's something that i think it would be nice to work on i i don't know if i can extract better pitch things from that i don't know at the moment i've i've only really gotten that to to sort of converge and work with i guess perceptual descriptors things like loudness centroid flatness pitch um the, the it works fine on those numbers when i try to do like mfccs or more sort of complex descriptors it it I, it doesn't work um but that just could be uh, i'm using the wrong settings and and uh, you, you, if i understood correctly you're using a uh kind of pick up contact microphone on this uh, device, or is it something more uh, tuned for, for, for your practice? Can you say something a little bit more of the kind of, uh, um, you know, because it's not a microphone in, in the traditional sense, right? It's not something you put frontal and um, in a sense that you're talking about pitch and everything, how, how would it be the system robust for, uh, another type of microphone or another type of input uh, uh, device. Yeah. So the speaking, I'll start from the, like the drum perspective, like historically drum stuff, you've either had an air microphone, like a 57 or some kind of thing on it, or for many, many, many years, we've had like contact microphones, like these drum trigger things that it's, it's literally a contact microphone with foam. And those, uh, I think there's been a lot of developments on over the years and they've improved and you can get fast tracking and the audio from them is fine. Well, the main reason, and I do have a set of those somewhere, um, the main thing I don't like about those is because in order for them to work well, they have to make a good amount of pressure on the drum and the drum just kind of sounds shit. Um, it's less the case, so for example, like it's not uncommon where you have a contact mic on your acoustic guitar or your violin or whatever. It doesn't, it, it'll Im impact the vibration, but like tiny amount. Whereas the drum, it's like, it's like you have your thumb on it. Like it's, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's like uh, dampening, uh, dampening your sound somehow. Yeah. And it, actually, I have, it, I have it here just next to me. So the sensory percussion hardware, so this is the sensory percussion one. Um, on the bottom here, I don't know if you can kind of see in the camera, is that little round thing. So that's an inductor, yeah. which is basically like a, a kind of a coil. I actually don't know exactly what's in there, but it's essentially a guitar pickup is kind of what mm -hmm. an inductor is. Um, or like those kind of weird mics that you put on like on your phone or your laptop and it does like, you know, picks up that. Picks ah, up like that. the electromagnetic field. Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess maybe not too dissimilar from like EMG EC stuff. Um, so what what this thing is, it's literally just a little guitar pickup. I mean, this is the DIY one here. So um, the way that it mounts on the drum, it sort of sits like this and is about, in my case, it's about a millimeter or two from the drum. So it doesn't touch it. But it does require some metal mass to move. So the way that um, this works and the sensory percussion works is you have a metal, a piece of metal on the drum and then that's what gets picked up 
But the software itself doesn't need doesn't know anything about that. The software receives audio. Um, so in SP Tools, I've built in a thing so you can tell it if you're using an SP Tools thing or using a contact mic or using an air microphone, and it has different filter curves that it puts to kind of uh, optimize for it. Or I've even done because uh, one thing that I often use is like on my drum I also have a DPA, a nice air mic. Um, is I'll do the let's say the onset detection from the sensory percussion and classification. But for descriptor analysis, um, I use the DPA. So I can use, I can tell it I'm doing a combo and it looks at just the onset detection from one, but the descriptors from the other. Um, yeah. So if I'm a, a violinist or a flautist or whatever, I can run audio into it and then you just tell it. I mean, it'll work r without you doing anything, but if you want to optimize you it. it. You can calibrate yeah. it based on your needs and uh, it will work with potentially any microphone. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I've, I've spoken with people like, and, and the reason why I'm expanding out is just because it wasn't my goal to do this, but I've just had emails from people or spoken to people who have done interesting things with flute or with voice or with beatboxing and it or using because the central percussion hardware is very expensive. So not a lot of people have it. So a lot of people are just using it with like a, a 57 or just a general microphone and getting good results. So, I mean, usable results. I think one of the main differences of having something that's like uh, uh an inductor based system is that you really, really reduce crosstalk, which is one of the things of, let's say like, even if I've got a drum and I'm doing, let's say like very fast hits, like with an air microphone in a room, let's say like I have a mic, like, you know, a couple feet from me, just the reverb and all this other stuff kind of masks acoustically some of that sound and you end up, it's very difficult to have a very accurate and very fast onset detection just on its own, much less all the classification. So by having a guitar pickup, it's almost like with an electric guitar, like I can be playing electric guitar and singing and it doesn't pick it up at all. It's sort of, it's not 100% isolated, but it's very well isolated. Um, so that's the the way that like, I guess to kind of answer your question, one of it is a practical thing of enabling things to allow for larger analysis windows that specifically get better resolution for pitch. Um, and then also having descriptors that are more like I, I recently added, I think the last update, um, a thing that lets you analyze um, sinusoidal components. So like different sine wave banks and corresponding gains, which for drums isn't massively useful, but I do use it to do like kind of resonator type um, stuff with it. So it was, I built it in for a specific reason, but I coded it such that you could use it for other things too. Um, so it's things like that to kind of enable these other use cases. Um, and at the moment, all the examples are still drums, but I think as I, as I near like future, uh, future updates, like the, the examples in the help files, I'm going to incorporate more variety. So it'll be like an example that's got guitar and an example that's got piano or whatever else. <laughs> So I couldn't really uh, delve um, uh, too much into it. I just want to know: Is it? Uh, do you have a GitHub repository where you know you you get um, uh, issues, tabs, or uh, things like that? Yeah, yeah. So I've got like the 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 GitHub is R Constanzo and then SP Tools. So it's here. I I I'm. Oh, yeah. I'm disciplined in that like I put all the releases on here, but like I don't push like I don't have another um, stem or whatever or another um, fork or whatever. Like I don't have a developmental fork like so that I'm doing locally. And then when the version is done, I put it up here um, and then it's got like, you know, the, the readme or whatever has all the videos as they go and a sort of a description of all the objects and um, yeah, a change log per version. So like this is probably the, the sort of the best spot for the things. And then um, as of the last version, I've also made like a Discord um, just for sort of discussion and kind of things like that. So this is, it's got an a okay amount of members now, like what, 77? Yeah, imagine as it goes, there there might be more sort of people discussing on here, which is kind of nice. With uh, being part of the sort of Flucoma thing, having like a, a the Flucoma discourse is super useful as like a resource of, there's tons of patches on here and lots of people answering questions. Um, but I think this requires like a, a critical mass of people using something to be useful. Like I'm, I'm sure historically you've been on, like there's a forum for some piece of 
yeah. hardware that like is abandoned. Nobody goes on there. So the, the discourse, I think, or, sorry, having a discord, I think is like a good middle ground where like people can sort of chat and ask questions on here, but like, um, categories also and everything. Yeah. So this is kind of new as of the last version of it. So hopefully this will, you know, build as it goes and have, you know, people sort of in the community sharing stuff in there. Lovely. Um, so what was your favorite, uh, thing that you saw at nine my favorite thing that i saw at nine it's a good question either, actually either as a tech thing or like presentation poster thing or and or performance if they're different i have to think about it because there were a lot of things that i was not expecting like for example vr it was very interesting work with vr and uh, it also was one of the first time that i experienced something with vr like in terms of um, motion and um, uh, sound and try to, to to get a kind of a grasp of how would you hear and experience a word of sound, a word of images inside a virtual reality um, a field. You know, there are so many calculations that you have to do when you move your head in a way, you know, you have to recreate them mathematically. And uh, sometimes you can also get kind of um, sickness uh, yeah. by being inside. So that was something interesting that I um, experienced. And uh, I really liked the demos, the day of the demos, because there was there was uh, Bella with the trill and uh, and other other gear. There were people uh, um, working on new keyboards, people working on new software, even uh, a guy uh, programming max patches using Python, a kind of um, autom automatic system of making max patches and also uh, generating some random codes to randomize and create a random max patch, which would function. And it would give you, you know, for example, a microphone input, some uh, kind of uh, sound effects and an audio output. And, uh, and it came out with a very interesting result that you would never expect, you know, even feedback system, uh, stuff like that. And uh, definitely the concerts, the concerts, uh, I mean, and the fact that I was in Mexico and it was very hot and uh, we had a concert in an open space. Uh, there was kind of a lightning uh, outside. It was not raining, it was lightning. And it was very great to see uh, live performance. And there was a kind of natural uh, uh, aspect of uh, visual happening wow. uh, around. That was something uh, really cool. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I really love the work of uh, Jack Armitage. It's really great, his detail uh, perception of uh, DMI design. Yeah, it was, it was so intense. It was like a five intense days, um, morning to evening, and uh, each one of them, they had their own uh, beauty. Um, even this one of Star Trek that I said to you is the one that really stuck upon me because it's so beautiful to, to you know, the fiction world uh, creates so many interesting... Uh, things that you know that uh, again the, the inventor and the director of that uh, star trek uh, uh, series didn't really care about what we as a as a designers as a as an instrument designers we care and we think about the technicality how would that sound if i do it like this or how can it sound which kind of tools shall i use but in the fictional world uh, everything is possible even to create an instrument that plays your own emotions and by looking at this from a different perspective, where everything is possible, then it's a very interesting way to approach the design of something new because you don't get limited by technicalities or, uh, and you can just really focus what it, the type of sound you want to have. And uh, I think this was the, mo the most interesting thing that I experienced there. Yeah, that's a cool idea. That I was just thinking now there's like in that famous from whatever the first Star Wars was where they go into the cantina band thing um, where it's like, yeah. Musically, it's kind of cheesy and hokey and doesn't sound futuristic. It's like, dun, 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 or whatever. Yeah, kind of jetsy or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, whereas I think, I mean, I I don't watch very much Star Trek, but I like I think the there's a lot more. It's like weird chess things. Like it, it's a little bit more futuristic. Whereas the yeah the the Star Wars yeah like a flute uh, with three or four uh, output or something you know kind of thing. I, I recently watched a bunch of whatever the most recent like Black Mirror um, series or whatever. And I, I'm sure there's a name for this kind of um, invented interfaces that are sort of 
future contemporary, like where they'll, it's like a phone, but it's like it's an unfamiliar interface that does like it's a little futuristic, but not like uh, whatever uh, minority report or something like that. Yeah. So there's a lot of this kind of technology or design stuff that it's it's um, often it's probably just to disambiguate. So it's not like branded. It's not like an iPhone or whatever. It's like a, some kind of other future phone. But um, yeah, it's an interesting world of that of like designing things that don't exist but are plausible. Um, but imagine, I don't know, it's, yeah, there's probably a, a very clear term for whatever that, that's kind of called. Yeah, there's definitely, yeah, but it's, it's indeed uh, an interesting um, uh, aspect of, uh, because indeed dealing with technical issues all the time and, you know, latency and the computational power, all this kind of thing, you really lose track sometimes of, you know, what is the real thing that you want to do. And imagining of something, maybe it doesn't work, maybe it's just written, it's not even painted or something like that. It's, it's beautiful. And another interesting uh, workshop that there was there was to, um, was to use uh, DAL-E, like this um, uh, kind of ChatGPT-based uh, 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 generative images, to input an, a, a digital musical instrument completely invented, and then it would come out with some images of how, for example, a flute that has a string attached to it and... Uh, it's played by the wind or whatever. You come out with some uh, output from uh, Dali and, uh, and you try to recreate the instrument or uh, also using AI from this perspective to give you some kind of completely random or uh, crazy non-realistic thing can open up very interesting scenarios. That was also something very cool. Yeah, stuff like that is, is kind of interesting to leverage. I mean, even just conceptually philosophically, I guess like collective human imagination as condensed through a specific training of a, a model kind of thing. Uh, so like, yeah, like a, a flute that has wings and can play underwater or whatever, you know, and like this produces an image that is uh, whatever those words mean symbolically in human, you know, all the whatever is fed into the, the language um, to then build off of that. Um, yeah, that stuff is super interesting. It's similar to what we were talking about before, like always working at the edges. Like so much of this cutting edge stuff is like big mega corporation. Like it's it's not it's not nefarious, but it's not like the best thing, you know. <laughs> like the 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 what what these models were trained on and how they were trained and how they're used and just even the the amount of like carbon generated to like train a model. Like you know, it's it's like a weird thing. Um, I did look at some stuff recently where I think. There was some article from, I think, Google talking about how, uh, I wish I could remember, but um, that rather than having, because their model is like like massive, massive, massive things that are trained on huge data sets, um, how much more curated and smaller um, networks perform better. Uh, and, and because they're need, you know, so it's it's making more out of smaller data sets, which is obviously better in, uh, along other things. But it was it was something like that, like Google talking about like okay, like all this open source stuff that's doing these smaller, like focusing on smaller networks, is producing better results. So it, it's it's kind of nice to see that there's some, not only like technological pushback on it, but also like uh, practically that like that's working better to a certain extent as opposed to training it on all of wikipedia and 4chan you know which will just spit up racist you know angry things at you <laughs> as has happened a bunch um i have one last uh, thing to show maybe before we yeah. uh, move to the conclusion or something just jumping back into max uh, i've been also working maybe i can share my screen on a little uh, package that uh, i'm trying to um, consolidate in max it's called modulo and uh, it's a series of uh, uh, abstractions, nothing too fancy, but it allows to... So it's, it's a, a library, a toolkit that is um, designed to prototype digital musical instruments or interf interfaces in this case. And uh, w there are uh, input uh, uh, modules, output modules. There are some uh, um, both audio and signal, uh, uh, both uh, audio signal and control signal processing and some utilities. And uh, the, let's say, the, the interesting part of it is that these are um, uh, B-patchers, so they're GUIs objects that you can just drag and drop into a max patch, and they work with uh, lists and uh, multi-channel. So you basically just drag and drop a few objects, and uh, you can create your own instruments. For example, uh, um, if you, uh, there is an FM synthesizer, we have a bunch of lists, 
Uh, you have some scaling object, uh, some uh, sending uh, through Max. Uh, you have some uh, generators, uh, uh, digital to audio converters. Then uh, you know you can recreate uh, kind of MIDI <laughs> MIDI controller, and you can just MIDI map all these uh, buttons. And you have a bunch of uh, built-in features to change some of the functionality. And this is really basically if you open a Max patch <clears throat> with uh, with uh, with a clipping. You can say today I want to make uh, um, an instrument that has uh, let's say four dials. You just you know basically copy this one, and you say I want to send them to perhaps my um, let's see MIDI note as a in this case is a dial, so it should be a control out. So you just drag this and drop, connect them together, and this can become a controller for your uh, um, for DAW. You can change the number, you can save the preset, and you can you know create a bunch of these uh, these um, these uh, thingies, and they are structured so that they can be module. Uh, it becomes kind of a modular system, and each one of those does the one thing that it's supposed to do. In this case, we have a dial. Everything is normalized from zero to one until you really want to scale them and make them function for uh, for other uh, for other things. And there are a lot of input modules. Some of them, they can be either, <clears throat> for example, sliders uh, or air sliders. And uh, the cool thing of this, for example, is that you can uh, you can have up to, in this case, up to, um, okay, this one is the thingy. If I open this, hopefully, if I extend the number of channels, you can go up to 16 for now. And uh, you can mute them, you can uh, randomize them, uh, you can do minus one to one. You have a playlist objects, you have uh, all these kind of things that hopefully can enable a very quick uh, drag and drop and create uh, an instrument. And in a way they look like, uh, if I open a help file, maybe, let's see. If I open the help file of, for example, the cross patch object you see you can uh, uh, you have this little thing here you can delete connect various things right <clears throat> and there's a bunch of uh, messages that you can send on uh, on the right inlet to change some of the functionalities some of them they're more you can customize them more for example if i open even the encoder knob Right, you can uh, you can do a bunch of things, and uh, I've been experimenting because most of the time you have to take code, reuse code, recreate your own GUI all the time, and you know you can have snippets and all these kind of things. But I came out to have a kind of place for myself where I store a lot of these objects, and I decided, okay, let, let me make something that you know allows me to quickly design some uh, musical interfaces and be able also to connect them to other packages easily by either OSC, MIDI, Max, sending them to Max, and uh, being multi-channel and using lists, it's very easy to connect things together instead of having uh, you know eight or 16 cables uh, playing together. And as a final thing, I'm trying to gather some, um, uh, cast, uh, let's say, commercial devices like the Oddball, for example, is this kind of ball that you can, uh, that has some motion tracking and, um, uh, how do you say, uh, can be used as a, as a uh, note generator, C, CC generator. And I'm trying to build some uh, uh, module for them. For example, the gyrosk uh, thing to have uh, some uh, um, values that can be um, played through, that co uh, communicate directly with, uh, with the gyroscope app. And uh, I don't know if I have, uh, let's see. Because some others like the Mayo and things like that, uh, they require to have external libraries. So what I've been trying to do is something that doesn't require external libraries. So not many of them, maybe in the examples one, there should be something more like the Holonist. Uh, I made a little theremin, I think. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear the sound. And you can, uh, you know, you can load your stuff. You have your career, this is the volume.
and this you know the, the cool thing is that everything is uh, either midi mapped can be midi mapped or you can have this kind of low level uh, things and connect your gear your modular whatever you want and just route and control things so yeah this is just to show i see that you've been also working a lot into the max side and uh, I'm, uh, I'm i'm i also have the github uh, version of this although i haven't shared it uh, yet <laughs> this is the first time i'm showing it to uh, to you and uh, it's open people can just uh, download and see you know what what are the basic things to do and hopefully i'm, I'm in touch with um, with cycling 74 to go through some feedback uh, so that hopefully it can be it can become something useful for other people and be shared on the uh, on the max uh, package package max packager how do you call it yeah, the yeah. package manager nice. that's it um, awesome. That looks really cool. And, and I think it'd be quite useful as, as that, like, okay, I have a setup. I want to just build a thing, a bunch of building blocks, put it together. Mm. Um, yeah, that's really useful. It reminds me, I'm trying to think, um, let me. Ah, Benjamin Vanessa, is it the one who made Upshot or not? Yeah, or that's not? it. Upshot. Yeah, that was very inspiring to me, definitely. That's a really good job. It's also in the, uh, I think yeah. it's also in the, box, the Max Package Manager. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's sort of a different focus, like I guess on more sound generating type things, but like, uh, yeah, I really liked seeing like one of the older videos where it's this sort of a toolbox of a modular thing where you kind of put a bunch of pieces together. So, but yeah, no, that's, that's really cool. I also really like the, the design, uh, like the UI and, and sort of the design language you've used in Modulo. Yeah, I try to make it neutral because I mean, you always give some kind of uh, imprinting to the things you make. But having also worked with some other artists, I've been always find uh, to have to pick up, you know, the kind of all algorithm, try to adapt it to that person. And all the time, you know, we, we all have a different uh, style, even programming and everything. You know, you're very clean also into your uh, programming to make things uh, um, understandable at first sight. Either they have more messy uh, environment. So my intention is to create something new, rather neutral that allows to have this kind of uh, multi-channel and, and list-based communication. So you don't have to really think of which one is going where, you know, you have a kind of very clear workflow and, um, and uh, you know, by drag and dropping these kind of modules, um, you, can, you, can, you can create your own, you can customize your own Canva with your own things. And, uh, but as you know, it's, it's a work in progress, <laughs> so uh, with a, <laughs> That's the signal, probably, that he's uh, hungry. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> one, of, one of the dogs, she loves to lay down by the feet, but she really hates feet. Like like if your feet kind of get near, she's like, ah! She's, she's now moved on to the sofa, and she's like, fuck that, the feet. And it's really kind of funny. So I didn't realize she was down there, so I moved my foot, and yeah, she let me know she sure. wasn't into it. <laughs> um cool yeah i mean it, it's good sort of chatting and, and having some time to kind of unpack the stuff i, I uh, you know look i look forward to sort of sending some of the nine stuff or the, the the presentation stuff i want to kind of look through some of that stuff and yeah definitely looking forward to like whatever you guys come up with in october november or whatever it was you said um yeah where that kind of goes because that's something as i said like it, it isn't a hugely central thing of me but like it's something that i i have experimented with the Mayos in the past um and it's something that yeah would be nice to fold in um but cool man yeah good chatting and um great. yeah let's great. let's be in touch yeah it's great that it's recorded so i can also go back and see all the links that yeah. you shared because i missed a lot of stuff but uh, yeah. yeah definitely definitely thanks a lot for your time same man cool have a good rest of your day if you'd like to support the making of these videos please join our patreon the link is in the description below thanks for watching